Hello. Whoever is here. Um, so, this is my first live stream. Yeah, I just wanted to say that one of the reasons why I've decided to do this is something I want to share with the musical, the music community, with musicians, to really kind of discuss what it is that we should be doing or could be doing, given that we're in a position of um, not being able to play live. Um, so it's something to think about what it is that you actually want to do with yourself as a musician, as a performer. Um, so I've been thinking about that quite a lot, you can imagine, lots of time uh, on my hands. Um, so yeah, I've basically been thinking, oh, what do you want to do? What do you, uh, what kind of, um, what do you want to leave behind, you know? Do you want to leave behind a list of gigs that you played? Do you want to leave music behind? Do you want to, uh, do you want people to have gotten to know you? Uh, yeah, you who to the elite jazz, right? Wicked. Um, so I've had to really think about that. And I made my mind up that it's important to me to get that right, you know, to um, be who I want to be musically as well as everything else that I do. Uh, you know, collaborations with other people, songwriting with other people, you know, all of that. So one of the reasons why I came to that idea was really at the start of COVID. I was terrified at the start of COVID, well, the lockdowns and everything. And it wasn't necessarily for the same reasons as everybody else. So um, actually, this is a good point to bring in something here into the room. I'm glad you love the backdrop, Phil. I am... Um, sourced it recently i've been creating my studio space it's like this tiny space in my room it's like you're in my 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 yolanda space right now okay so um yeah i was terrified about the uh, at the start of the lockdown and why i was terrified was this i'm going to read you a poem i wrote in april and uh, this is what terrified me here's my poem it's called, Remember to Smile. Remember to smile, don't, don't look away, I am not your enemy. Or smile with eyes when I say good day, covered face gives little away. No warmth, no reply, if I say hello from afar, is that death in disguise? Stranger equals danger, is that your alibi? Why? State sanctioned hostility, loss of interpersonal humanity, a reason now, total legitimacy, to be cold and cruel, avoidance at all. We all agree now, do we, that it's fine to be just plain nasty? Did you know, as I walk by, your children no longer respond to a smile. They feel your fear and collect your energy. That's what they learn as they walk the almost empty streets. Is there imagined repair just suddenly? One day the state says, OK, now you're free. And in an instant, your family will be like they were before. I don't believe. Those hungry eyes, confused and searching for information, become informed by your education. The disease of the soul, the damaged mind, grows in absence of being kind. We're forgetting who we really are. In fear of an enemy at the door, we could be together more. Instead, we choose to ignore our human instinct to love. When I walk, I shall continue all the while to say hello with no regrets towards the hostile. Instead, I'll carry the warmth I feel when one of you responds to me and remembers to smile. So that was how I was feeling at the start of lockdown. And I felt a strange reminiscence of, you know, I, I'm not going to spend all night talking about politics and race and all sorts of things, but it was something that occurred to me, which was that that strange hostile feeling of you being a stranger, strange danger, and it's you, you're the stranger and you're the danger. I felt that before. Many times before COVID and the lockdowns, I felt that as a black person, many times. Uh, not every day, and I've got a multitude of friends from all backgrounds. Just that feeling, that sensation of somebody just having this hostility towards you, that was a real thing. So when, I, when the start of COVID happened, that feeling that I just read to you in the in the poem, that was familiar, actually. It reminded me of what it's like to be a black person in a white space sometimes, or sometimes even a woman in a male space, if it's a particularly, you know, like sort of space. So 
I I had a <clears throat> it was a strangely familiar feeling and it didn't feel good. But what I did was used what I felt and wrote poems. I wrote songs, and then I really started to think about what I wanted to do. And this is what I want to do. And I like to sing a bit, but not much. And I certainly love to write lyrics. So I'm doing that with my band, uh, the uh, Project PH. You can see that in the uh, top left. It's for you. I don't know. Why. Anyway, there. And um, I'll be sharing things <clears throat> about the band over time. And within that environment, I'm going to express myself in the way that I would do if I wasn't working for somebody else. So I would potentially go a bit political at times. I'd certainly share my perspective of what it's like to be me and all the things that I am, mother, black woman, English, um, bass player, you know, all the sort of labels you can add in there. That will, that's all in my lyrics, that's how I write. So to musicians, I would say, have you got an outlet to express who you are? Does it feel like a, do you have a home for your creativity? Um, thank you, Enceladus Waters. That's, I appreciate your comment. Um, so that's what I've been thinking about quite a lot. And I started trawling back through all of my hard drives and everything and found all these performances with my band, The Deep MO. And I realized that I have all of this content, you know, that I haven't been sharing because I don't have that band anymore. And I'm a session musician, that's what I do. And that band now, because we're not on the road and all of that, and we only did a few gigs actually, um, I just thought, well, that's dead. But it isn't, it's music and it's still very much alive. So I started taking it out of the, um, <clears throat> you know, blowing the cobwebs off. And I realised that it's actually really good. It's okay. And maybe it's maybe I could do better. I mean, I hope I can next time round with the new band, Project PH. But um, it's good enough, you know. It's good enough. So I think what I'll do now, actually, is play something, try something. This might not work because, you know, internet connections. I've been trying to hardwire this thing and... Oh, I'm not going to bore you with all the technical stuff, issues with these things. I'll probably have to upgrade my computer and all of that. But um, I'm going to play along or try to play along with a performance of mine. But I'm not going to sing because this performance has me already singing on it. Let's give it a try and see how it goes. All right. Hold on a moment. Let me get it again because I actually was trying it out earlier. And I would like to get it from the start. So I'm just going to grab it now, video file, and here it is, this is from the start. Um, this is my first go at this, so let me know how it's going with the old sound, I've no idea what you're going to hear. <laughs> it sounds great from my end. I'll keep okay. How's the balance? <laughs> Got what it 
Okay, so that's that track was written a long time ago with my other band, and um, the lyrics were kind of applicable to what's going on now in, in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, you've got the we've got what it takes, but they're not listening. They say it's better for the greater good. I feel like people aren't really listening to each other at the moment, which is a real shame. And you know, that's part of what the issue is for me: is how do we focus in on listening to each other better? But to me as well, that goes into the whole being a musician thing. Because as musicians, we could listen to each other better as well. Thanks, Hugo. I appreciate the feedback. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think we could listen to each other as musicians more. And I mean that in the literal sense that when you're playing together, you actually get your attention onto the other musicians to come out of you being in your hands and fingers in the way that we can get a little bit too focused narrowly and I think that that's part of um, what will make us actually better musicians is to pair ourselves with each other on stage like focus in on what's going on um, and we've, obviously we're, we've nailed what we're playing we're, we're playing what we play we are that instrumentalist. We should be practised enough. I mean, that's one of the things I will say is a little bit of a get out for us all is that most of the time these days we are under rehearsed. We do not rehearse. So when I was uh, in my rugby days, we did six weeks rehearsal. Six weeks. Maybe you guys that are watching now know um, about how things used to be when there was money in the business, but we used to rehearse for a long time before tours and then the production rehearsals and everything now it's narrowed and narrowed and narrowed and we managed to sort of fit it in I mean I, when I do club gigs there's no rehearsal it's a sound check rehearsal which means that all of the work that's done in preparation is at home but not together I do think that actually counts towards how performances um, you know move um, or how they how they come across um, there's a sort of nervous energy which can add a bit of excitement to things, which is cool, you know, I like that. But at the same time, I like it when people have rehearsed <laughs> and we know what we're doing so we can just relax and just maybe like not be thinking about arrangements so much and actually trying to develop some little moments between each other. Um, I think that's important to go beyond the functional sort of side of performing and actually get into the sort of more... Um, connected side where we really start to enjoy being together as musicians but we can't do that when we're under rehearsed so there's that as an element but that aside imagine that now we are rehearsed I still feel that we we, we put a performance hat on and we think okay I'm performing um so I'm in a mode maybe and I think the people who have to have a persona to perform because they may be very shy or have anxiety which I actually did have quite a lot of anxiety um yeah that's fair enough but sometimes that can be a bit of a barrier so one of the things that I think which I know I'm biased right but I think bass players have a particular attention to detail in our role in the band why do I think this well I think this because the rhythms we play, right? 
They're very specific. A bass line is a rhythm and a melody. It's a part. It's got a specific role. And usually it's in relationship with, say, the kick drum or another rhythm guitarist is playing something or, you know, it's written the way it's written for space, to allow space for the vocals to come through. And to that end, bass players, good bass players, who don't overplay, sometimes I overplay. We all kind of get a bit naughty sometimes, but most of the time, when I'm being at my best, we have to really specify the role, the or the function or the role of the bass line in the song really well, you know, um, to allow the music to sound as good as it could do. Now, that means that there's a specific um, area of listening that bass players live in that maybe I don't know what it's like to be a drummer or a keyboard player or a guitarist on stage, but I feel like we occupy a space of awareness and listening that others don't, not in the same way. In their way, as good. This is not a, you know, a hierarchy of bass is best, bass is best. But I'm not saying that it is officially. That's just my little joke. However, I do think that that speci specificity, oh God, that specific role is really important to understand as a bass player. Now, we don't always understand that as bass players. That's why I end up mentoring people <laughs> because I explain these things about how to listen to yourself and how to listen to the role and one of the ways in which I do that is by playing eighth notes right it's one of my things there's lots of other ways but this is one of the ways I like doing it right so I'm going to try and run logic right and it's just this dodgy old drum track forgive me drummers that are in the room because I did I just I've been off run off my feet I was even in curries or something a bit oh, is it still I don't know whatever it was getting some uh <laughs> adapters and stuff like only an hour ago so so tell me how this sounds okay i know it's whack but please forgive and uh, maybe forget also can one hear the loop right now and how does it sound feedback i want some feedback i can hear it okay even if you can't hear it right i can so i'm gonna play so, like, I'm just going to play a G. That's the fourths. Unless you want to play. Anyway, sorry, sorry, I'm getting carried away. Okay, so, so eighth notes, right? So, the way I play, oh, great, thanks, Corey. I'm going to play these notes. This is my bass part, right? And it's quite fast, actually. It's uh, 120, I think. Damn, a little quick. Anyway, this is a sort of not held difference between playing these notes short and sharp. So what I'm doing with my left hand, I'm sort of squeezing, letting go, squeezing, letting go like that. If I don't let go, you've got a long note, right? I can alternate that. short again that's a dynamics are now quiet and loud as opposed to long and short <laughs> a bit more rocky this is me just playing hard I'm just literally playing like that no distortion I'm creating the distortion by overdriving the sound that I know I can push no level change from anything else just me playing harder or then that's maybe more sometimes more of a rock vibe and then other times um, I may drop into a more punky vibe where's my where's my special hands and the plectrums oh I hate them I'll do this play it like that so I don't know how many ways round that was but that was six I think there's many more it's a bit fast to play all the subtle ways to do it 
um, at 120, but just bear in mind that that's just one bass line of eighth notes with no rhythm changing at all. But the scope of a bass line is wide, down to touch, tone, approach, application, all of that stuff. That's a bass player's world. That's where we live in this subtle thing. Anyway. All right, all right. So yeah, that's one of the things that I like to talk about with bass players and to other people as well because when uh, somebody says, you know, hey, there's this jam, let's play this song. And maybe the bass player knows it kind of vaguely, but not intimately. It's a really uncomfortable place for us, unless we want to just jam it, which is fine. Jamming it's fine. But if it's a famous tune and there's a famous riff, you don't want to play it wrong, really. Because everybody knows the riff, it's a melody. And you want to play it right. But if you don't really know it, then you have this weird feeling of feeling terribly unfaithful to a great bass line that you want to absolutely kill but you don't remember it well enough and that difference between actually playing different um, rhythms over a song that you know really well but the bass line is just subtly off wow any bass player hearing it will know instantly you don't know the bass line you don't remember it <laughs> because it's like a signature of a song a bass which is why I love um What's the tune, anyone? Let me see it in the comments. Anyone? I'm not gonna sing it. Bom dum gada da da gada. So that was anybody? Natural mystic. There's a natural mystic blowing through the air. I'm a big Bob Marley fan. Yes, thank you, Bob. That's Family Man Barrett. And in fact, I actually, um, I did read not long ago, it was years, but, you know, not massively long ago, that he was um, assigned actual royalties for those bass lines as part of uh, an integral part of the compositions, um, which I believe on bass, that's not how it goes for us. We will write a hook line on bass, but we don't necessarily get credited uh, with the writing for it. And that is something... I think it would be great if it changed. I mean, my approach, this is no comment on how anybody should do their thing, right? We all do what we've got to do, and I don't want to hold my hand up and say what I do is right and everyone else should follow. It's just my um, it's just my kind of way I want to move through the world as when I have the power to, which is that when I write, um, even if I've written most of the song, my plan is with my band is that I'm giving them all writing, I've decided that everybody that's on the record, singers, the instrumentalists, the drummer, who may have only, only just added a killer beat, right? I mean, come on. Uh, I'm not going to pay him with, or reward him with part of the writing. I mean, that he's written a, ba a drum part. It's not just but cat, but cat, but cat. It's his but the cat, but the cat. <laughs> it's the way he plays it. And it's unique to that individual. And so for me... I'm saying you've put part of your spirit is on that record. You need to be rewarded for that. So that when, if anything that I ever do gets any royalties, I don't really release, I haven't really released music for that. But I know that once those PPL checks or the whatever we get as a performer stops coming in because somebody's covered it or whatever, I know that everybody's still going to be receiving something from that. And that's to me, it feels like the a unifying community spirit of what making music is all about. It's all about being together. It's all about sharing. It's all it's in a situation that doesn't occur unless everybody is in the room. If everybody uh, and whoever's in the room is contributing part of their musical soul into the performance and the music. And like I say, I am not judging others for not doing this because I know about the costs I know what it costs I put records together I know that you know every time you you 
you pay somebody something, there's a whole a bunch of other costs behind it that people are unaware of. And you can't always reward people because they don't know that you're actually 10, 15, 20, 50 grand in the red. So you're hope, hoping to even get a little bit of that back. And you can't just be doling everything out. But um, I've, you know, I'm, I'm seeing what I do as, as not really a money making thing. I'm seeing it more as a, a choice about how I live my life. I want to live my life that way. Um, and it doesn't matter if I don't make money that way because I can always get jobs to make money, even if it's not a lot. So anyway, that's one of the things. So this is a good point at which to share. Um, we did, me and my band, actually, <laughs> I think it was like 2019. It might have been, I don't know. I think it was. We, we went into the studio. Um, Glenn Tilbrook uh, from Squeeze uh, kindly let me use his studio to record my demos Um of my band so we record demos and i'm going to play you now a video of us listening to a, a recording we just did now what that was was we re recorded everything that you're about to hear was recorded live and including the vocals we were reasonably separated but we wanted to you know just capture it we didn't and I, we didn't have a click no click track um but yeah so let me just find this video. Let's hope it works. And uh, do let me know in the comments if anything's gone wrong. Yeah, it was 2019. I can see it on the file now. Lovely. Check this out. Sorry, it's called It's Not You. It's not released yet. It's Paul, Paul Stacey that was producing with us. So this is the one that you look that you look like you look second to last one. Yeah, I got you on camera. <laughs> <laughs>
So yeah, that is uh, that was one of our first sessions in the studio together, and um, for me, you know, I, I was going to release something that came from that, and in fact, I did. We released a track called "Maybe I," which I might play you. I don't know if any of you've heard that. It's just, you know, it's on the web, but not in a. I didn't push very hard with the with the tracks because you know all I want to do at the moment is just create a presence for my band and my music and. Um, when we have a track that I really want to push, I'll kind of get on that then. But at the moment, I just want to create a story. So it's a slow grow, and I haven't got any impatience about that. It's just as it's going to be. But yeah, we were in the studio for the first time, and I was just basically saying to the boys, I wrote these songs. Um, I know how I want them to go, but I don't know what I want you to play. All I know is that I'm going to try and lead you physically with my body so that we don't need a click so that we can allow the music to speed up naturally or slow down naturally where it feels like it needs to do that <clears throat> and so especially especially on that on the next tune that i'll play you actually i won't play uh it wasn't so much on this one the other one was it's difficult to sing and play without uh time we really had to see each other we had to be able to see each other's eyes almost or certainly body language because um it was all about the dynamics and capturing the moment um and we had to be unified and in, in the studio it basically <clears throat> you get this kind of like red light kind of factor uh and that actually creates a bit of tension at times and the nervousness sometimes you don't play your best performance um because of that that anxiety so what we tend to do is we record one and then we just go straight into the next version uh, straight after almost without just let let it roll and capture the next one um and that can help with um you know that kind of anxiety about the red light being on you know in record everybody it's like, oh my God, in record. so um with this i wanted to really capture um that focus and you can get it in the studio but it's that red light that adds it the red light adds that focus and when it's when it's kind of why I brought that up about the red light is the red light adds um a little bit of nervousness but it does focus you as a musician to really be on point with what you're trying to play um when we're on a gig sometimes that focus is missing and people are not paying as good attention as they could to each other um and they're not listening as hard so we almost need a 
a kind of sense of that same level of focus, but without the red light anxiety that can come. And actually use it to really hone our part and make it feel deliberate, like intended, intentional. Um, even if it is improvised, even if it just was a moment that just happened. Because, you know, we did go a little bit nuts at the end of that one. <laughs> I've got a couple of other versions. That was the one that we videoed. I've got another one that was a little bit more controlled. Um, but, you know, that's why I shared that one with you, because I've got the video to go with it. But, um, yeah, it was just an, a great way to express ourselves recording, was to not have the click, to, to watch each other and really... Um, feed off each other so that even though we were going a bit nuts at the end you still got moments where we really locked in you won't have heard it because you've only heard it once through but um me and the drummer accidentally on purpose kind of played some patterns and little shapes at the end of phrases um together at the same time um, without having planned to do so and that comes from paying attention <clears throat> it's like um one of the things i do when i'm doing college courses um, just doing some lecturing or, or workshops or whatever, is um, we we play a game which is called one, two, you play three, right? So if you're listening, I play one, two, three. You know where three is going to be, right? One, two, three. And maybe I'll change the tempo at randomly, but it will always be one, two will always be of a distance that you can predict what three is. So whatever one, one is one wherever two comes you know where three is but only if you're listening right so one two three one two three one two three one two three but you have to pay attention because if you catch people uh sort of sleeping a little bit on that you get them comfortable with a one two three one two three say like that and I'll do three of them in a row and then I'll go one, two. <laughs> so many people miss that because they're just not, they've settled into a comfortable place and they thought they knew what was going to happen next because they'd already sort of mentally decided that this is what's happening next and had jumped the gun or were, just missed it because they were, they were waiting for the slower tempo. That's um, an exercise to just remind people to pay attention because things can change. Now that's an extreme thing and it's a game. So obviously I'm trying to catch them out, right? And I always catch them out. <laughs> but in an actual gig or a jam session, what you want to do is pay attention so that when those things happen, you know, a drummer might, just might, rush a little bit on a fill, maybe. Or maybe a soloist is getting a little bit carried away. Uh, you've got to go with them to make the music work. That's something I've learned reasonably late in life. In some ways, I've been a bit, a little bit, a bit of a click. What do they call me? A click dictator. <laughs> Why did I tell you that? I'll get called that. So it's like, no, the click, chick, 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 it's the master. I'm not like that about the click anymore. What I feel about a click is that a click is fluid, and you can play with a click. You can um, just have the click there, but you aren't actually playing on it you're playing before it after it but it's moving it's moving around it's loose looser than it it uh is, is treated sometimes there's this sort of feeling like you have to keep into i was it was 100 bpm i was at last time so i'm going to go down to i'm going to go down to 80 80 let's go to 80 and all i'm going to do i'm not going to play those awful drums um because it's an insult to listen to that loop i didn't pick a good one there's some good ones in apple loops but this that wasn't a good one so i'm not saying so here's um here's our click. Lovely click. Don't we just love clicks? No. So it's actually quite fast. For what I'm gonna do. 80 BPM. So what am I gonna play? Oh. <laughs> what time signature did I put that one to? Let's just do four, three, eight. There we go. Too fast. Okay. So now I'm playing with more behind the. 
the beat now. You know what, you probably hear it better with a drum track. So let me just put that awful drum track back on. Oh, you know what, give me a second, right? I'm gonna grab, <laughs> I'm gonna grab a quick loop. So I can see, find a shuffle. Let's see, what's this one like? Ooh, hello. A little bit of Brazilian jump set. What say you? Shall I drop it in? I think I will. Okay, here we go. Now it's on. Okay. Are you feeling it? <laughs> Where's Phil when I need him? Phil's here, or he was here. If you see somebody called Bongo Saloon, right, that's Phil Gould. So Phil Gould is uh, in the house. If you're in the house, Phil, drop, a, drop a, a message in the chat and say hi to everyone. So here's the older, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. I'm just making this up, I don't know what I'm playing. So I'm playing, I'll try and play reasonably on top. Now, if I just delay a little bit. I have to sort of move my body in silly ways to get it. That's ridiculous now. <laughs> really late. So listen to the kick drums. You'll hear how out I am with the kick. But somehow, it's not terrible. It's got an anticipatory feeling about it. Okay, so you can mess about and make it push and pull. So. So you can play with it more and more and just make it really behind or on the beat. So that's one of the things that bass players like to do is to find a sweet spot in the groove and we can play where we're completely almost married to the kick drum and that kick drum allows us to feel really unified um if i had a, a live drummer here which i will eventually i'll be able to do all of that you know things as, as i learn how to do this streaming malarkey um yeah, so say right now, I want to pull that back. It's like I was doing. I was going. Now, the thing about that is that sometimes a drummer might slow down to join me behind the beat, which means that it ain't behind the beat anymore. It means it's slowing down, right? So you can't really do that kind of behind the beat stuff unless the drummer is a solid player. And then conversely, the drummer might want to be playing quite a lot behind. It's always good when a drummer plays um, some one part of one of his instruments, hi-hat something, in a different place. So the kick drums can be behind the beat, and then the hi-hats are on top of the beat. Now, what I would say about that, right? I don't want to talk drums. I do want to talk drums. I want to talk drums. I love drums. Okay, so Clyde's double filled, right? Listen to his drumming. If you analyze his drumming, you will hear that his kick, where he places the snare on his hi-hat, uh, some of the grace notes, uh, 
they're not in the same pocket. Not everything is in the same place in the pocket. Some things are ahead. Some things are behind the beat. Some things are on top. That is what gives his feel. On, and that kind of funky drumming, that's, that's, that's that feeling. Now, when you look at Chris Dave, I believe... He does it in a more exaggerated way. So you can hear this kind of like lumpiness almost, but a really sick, sick group. Really great. But I think Hyde Stubblefield, that's what he's he does, that funky drummer. So when I hear somebody playing, I'm like, nah, the grace notes are swung. But the kicks, hi-hats on top. Do you like my beatbox? Hey, who knew? <laughs> okay, so I live and breathe drums. I don't want to play them because I love playing bass. But drums, man. Do you know what I mean? It's just a beautiful thing. So that takes, again, this skill of listening and learning how to listen to each other. So um, I don't know if I'll play the whole thing, but I'll play a video, which is... Um, the kind of single that we released, my band and I, uh, last year, year before, <laughs> 2019. We lost our year. We lost 2020. We lost it, okay? But you say last year, you mean 19, basically, right? If you say last year, you mean 19. 2020, yeah. so this track is the, um, <laughs> I love the comments. The challenge is a song where you play bass, drums, acoustic, and sing. Whoa, one person band. Who does that? Do you do that? <laughs> if you do that, I want to see that. Okay, so um, this track is the track that when we were in the studio on the same session I just showed you from the last one, <clears throat> we um, had no click and this was the one where I had to do a lot of this. And I always do an anticipatory beat. So it'd be like, and downbeat, and downbeat. And I was doing that on the intro especially and just trying to feel. Now, I think if we were to listen to it in a very strict way, we would um, hear that it speeds up and slows down. It's not metronomic, but it doesn't need to be metronomic. That's not what it was about. So I'm going to play this uh, track. Um, oh, maybe I can't. We'll see. It's actually on one of my external drives. So what that might mean is that it's going to be a bit glitchy. So I will try to play it to you. Um, and it's only 51. It's 200 meg. Okay, let's give it a try. Let's see how we get on.
an example of about of what I'm talking about literally that um you know we we played that with the mental kind of approach in my head I don't know what was in the boy's head and everything but in my head I was thinking classical music I was thinking about a conductor and I was thinking about the music being alive and it breathing and being allowed to express itself and we were just ch ch channeling it or allowing it to come through because that made um, it feel like we were communicating but not only together but actually within the actual body of music we were creating something we were creating a, 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 a an actual entity which is a, a piece of music and we will never play it the same way twice because of this, because it's all about expression and it's about the moment and it's about how it feels. And so on that day, that is how we recorded that song. And um, I don't know if, if there are any musos, proper like fusion-y type people here because fans of fusion, but that's Scott Kinsey on keyboards. So if you know who Scott Kinsey is, if, if you don't know who Scott Kinsey is, please look him up. He is probably one of my if not i mean favorite p keyboard players um he is incredibly accomplished what you heard was his subtle accomplishment which is his taste um but obviously he's a chops guy as well and, and a beautiful soul um but yeah so uh that experience really taught me something <clears throat> because you know if you think about it like you know i've been doing this for 30 plus years certainly as a professional musician anyway, and longer than that as a musician, you know, child. And um, when I was recording in the 90s, um, I wasn't, um, we were recording live. We were recording live, we were recording to two inch. We were recording on an analog desk. And, you know, I was watching the tape ops with their razor blades out, trying to do a drop in on, on on tape which is scary editing tape with, by cutting it up which is a scary thing to watch especially if it was a great performance you don't want them to, to kill it because you know and then sticking it together again and then if they're doing any edits and um so i come from as, as well as the fact that i came from uh professionally i came from a rock pop background privately my own sort of style of music was always funk and soul and jazz but as a session musician my first um proper tour and working with a professional artist um, a mainstream artist was Paul Weller and um, he recorded live we recorded live we did any patching up we needed to do if anybody made a mistake or but it was live you know and I know I hear 
it, it's just an opinion, right? And, you know, forgive me if you don't agree, which is fine. You cannot agree. <laughs> but my feeling is that I hear the click in people's recordings now. I can hear the presence of a metronome overlord tick-tocking all the way through everybody's performances because we're using it a lot of the time as um, a way of staying in time. But it's actually, how I see it now, is as a guide. And I learnt this way round of perceiving a click by working with Hans Zimmer. So it's fairly recent. I only started working with him in 2014. We had this click going on in our ears, like all through the shows and everything. And I started to get really like, oh, God, the click, I hate the click, you know, because you need it because it's the music's, you know, so many sp spaces of no, no time. You have to actually have somebody has to conduct and we didn't have a conductor. So we had this electronic thing going on, drove me nuts for a bit. And then I actually kind of realized what it was there for. It's a guide. It's a guide. It's not the boss. The boss is the music. The music dictates little moments where things kind of ebb and flow. So that was one of the things I started um, perceiving, um, uh, the ways that I started perceiving a click. And now I see a click as my friend. I can play off it. I don't have to play on it. And I don't have to stick with it. Um, little, a little tip, actually, for people who write. And uh, so... One of the things that I'm sure that quite a few of you probably know this if you're musicians. OK, so I'll just say it anyway, when you're recording, if you have to record to click because you really need to for a reason. But there's certain sections that lacking a kind of energy that uh, you would have normally on a live show. The trick is at the chorus, speed it up by three or four BPM. Or if a section feels a bit odd. Maybe it feels rushy. Um, just slow the click down so that your template, your click template has movement in it and it can give your music a feeling of that ebb and flow that you would have without it. But it's still being played to click so you can do all the editing really easily and everything. So, OK, so things to talk about with you all. So I want to share with you what my plan is, right? This Twitch stream, I like it. Obviously, I like talking. <laughs> thinking oh god I'm gonna be talking to myself for an hour that's weird but actually it's totally fine I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> so I'm here having happy to talk to myself but my intention is definitely to have guests um, I'm using uh, StreamYard uh, thanks to the lovely Phil um, Daniel who's just a mate now he's just saved my bacon basically and I'm really grateful to him because uh, he he helped me out with my setup and I've discovered this StreamYard um, process and I really like it. And it's really easy for me to invite guests on from all over the world, uh, time zone allowing. So my scheduling will change because I will have people from North America or uh, wherever I can get hold of them from coming on uh, as, a, as a, a shared stream. And so that will mean it won't always be at this time, but I'll give you plenty of notice for people that want to come back for more. Um, and that's one of the things I want to do is I want to create this community of sharing our experiences and our wisdom and our intuition, um, our impressions, uh, opinions, and certainly our stories and anecdotes about what life's been like as a musician. You can imagine, right? In 30 years, I've got lots of stories. I got some I can't share, actually. I might get slapped on the wrist if I share them. So I'm going to keep that like, <laughs> I have to be careful because I get a bit carried away and then I can be like, wake up at five in the morning going oh no that was when I used to drink alcohol wasn't it no okay so I don't do that anymore I don't get anxiety anymore but I do have to be careful to watch my gob so despite that I will have some stories I can share and I'm sure that all my guests will have these amazing stories that they can share too which is going to be really great for you guys to get a little bit of insider experience about what it's like um, I also intend to do some performance stuff. So this is just my little spot here, but because obviously I'm using an online browser, um, as long as the internet's good, I'm going to take my computer out with me and go places. You're going to see sound checks. You're going to see rehearsals. You're going to see um, maybe even gigs. Maybe. I don't know if I can do that. We'll see. Um, uh, you're going to see me on tour. I'm going to take um, and keep streaming from wherever I am in the world. Um, touring is scheduled 
to start up in January next year. Still got quite a way, but we're nearly halfway there. So I've got six months of messing about, writing, um, which I'm going to be doing a lot of. In fact, I've just written a killer tune with my band this week. I'm so happy. Um, so, yeah, there's going to be a lot of that. And, uh, yeah, so just spread the word. If you, if you, you know, your musician, my musician friends who are here, write to me if you want to be a guest. We've all got insights to share. It's going to be conversations, um, going to be some music. I don't know how much to orientate this to bass players specifically because um, I want to, you know, be um, <clears throat> a, a place for music fans to come to. So if I get too, you know, into the whole, this is how you play Donna Lee. I, it's like, do they want to see that? I don't know, man. I don't know if I want you. I don't watch bass player videos. I, I like music. So if I can make something sound good uh, musically and then have it as a teaching moment for bass players who are also watching, then great. But a lot of the stuff where I'm going to be sharing is more like um, mentoring and musicianship kind of tips about approaches. Like I just shared an approach about um, how to play with a click to make it sound more natural or how to play with a band so that you don't have a click but it still feels cohesive and together and you do that with the visual cues and so there's all of that but yeah it's going to be interesting doing this I'm quite excited um, because I have a lot of creativity to share with you all I'm writing a book um, my book is almost done I've paused it for the moment because <clears throat> there's so many things going on that I don't want to finish the book too early so um, it's paused but that's good. And I might read a little bit from it for you. Maybe you'll be all sort of logging off when I start droning on. But, you know, it's my space. I can do what I want in here. Um, and you're welcome to join me. So I'm going to keep going for the moment. I should say I was going to do a night till 9.30. And I think a couple of people are joining us towards the end. And I don't want them to log on and find that we've I've ended earlier than I said, which would be a shame. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about was about <clears throat> in fact actually in a moment I'm going to share one of my previous incarnations so my band the one before this was called the deep mo and I loved that band um but I had to um you know just I couldn't continue with it for various reasons um and like I mentioned at the start of my stream this evening I had a perspective of it that it wasn't like you know up to par and you know I wasn't on, focused on it but I watched some videos back and thought you know it's cool so I'm going to play you a live thing and then I'm going to talk about something that might be useful for a few bass players in the audience so let me just delete that one hopefully I won't disappear I didn't that's good now I'm going to find my um, thing that I was going to share with you uh, where is it? Okay, so basically what this is, is a movies. I think it's basically one of the gigs that I did with my band. And it's when I was supporting um, Level 42. Luckily enough to support Level 42. And I'm going to play you a bit of this, maybe not all of it, just to explain something to you all. Uh, which one? Maybe this one. Okay, this is called Do That Thing. This is from... 2010, so it's like getting on, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah. It's something that I do. 
like to share that was because um, I get asked a lot about singing and playing. And uh, I was singing and playing, you know, I was doing my thing. I was uh, trying to be a lead singer, which I was very reluctantly doing that. I did that because of the um, call for it, which was that I didn't have the means to add a musician on vocals, a singer. And it just felt like... Well, I don't want to be stumped by that. I'd already written the songs. I already had it all organised. I didn't want to bring a, a singer in and then just dictate to them, sing my songs and sing them the way they like them. And and your your basically your contribution is to reproduce. Okay, so cool. Um, your job is to reproduce my um my stuff, and I just thought it was unfair to do that to a creative person. You know, to stymie them, to stop them from actually, um. Uh, being creative so I decided well the only way to sing it if I want to sing it my way I got to sing it my way so I did that uh, so how did I do that you know I mean I'm going to do a whole thing on another day I'll advertise pre-advertise so that bass players can all turn up for that thing and I'll do a kind of bass player masterclass anyone can join but it will be very bass oriented and quite news oriented so maybe um, music fans might want to watch that or maybe you might be curious and you might enjoy it so I'll, I'll properly advertise this and do it uh, in a very constructive way more like one of my college master classes that I do for various places um, around the country or now online god I hate online oh, I don't mind it like this this is cool but teaching online and all of that is just dry man it's just not where it's at mm, 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 mm. you know why Actually, it's because I need the nuance. What did I say about that bass thing? You know, play notes and notes. You need to just nudge people's experience of playing in, you know, just here and there, and just and you kind of need to be physically present. And a lot of what we do is about tone um, and touch. And to exemplify that, or just audio only, you need to see the person's hands almost, you know, there's a lot missing. Anyway, so talking, playing, singing, playing, bass player, bass players do not like doing that a lot of the time. They find it really confusing. They find it, um, you know, just throws the bass line off a lot of the time. Oh, by the way, I changed basses because I wanted to show off my, uh, my custom. Isn't it lovely? My Fender four string custom, it's so pretty. That design was made by Madeline Hanlon. She burnt it into the wood. And um, it is just... And then there's a little design in the middle that's a personal sort of motif that I might get a tattoo of one day. I don't have tattoos, but I might get tattooed of that. And, uh, yeah. So the singing and playing thing, the thing that we do, when, we, when people stand up front and play or sing, they're right in the middle of the focus of all of the attention all the audience's attention is on them I don't like that feeling of being the center of attention <laughs> you'd think uh on stage I like being behind at the back playing bass right um, in my new band I don't sing lead vocals but I do do a bit of backing vocals um and I got a feeling of that sensation and it's terrifying right so what I ended up doing was just making sure that I knew my stuff like inside out and one of the ways that is one of the ways that you create a really great relationship with the bass and the vocals is you make sure that you really know your stuff. You know the bass line backwards, upside down. You know it. You don't need to think about it. It's done. It doesn't matter what's going on with the chords, how many chords, how busy it is. Um, you can just do it. So, um, let me think. Okay. I don't know why I chose this bass line because I haven't played it for, uh, for a while. I know it seems really busy and it is. Do you know why this bass line is busy? It's busy because I wrote it on guitar. <laughs> and I'm a rhythm guitarist, not a, not a soloist. When I say rhythm guitarist, I'm not a rhythm guitarist. When I play guitar, I play rhythm. One. Two. You can feel the beat because I'm not playing the drums, of course, so you can't really see, hear the pulse. One, two, three, four. 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 One, ka, da, ka. Oh, that's too much. <laughs> I was going to try and do my beatbox thing on work. Although, I'm a pretty 
practice it so that I can do it next time, but we'll see. So what I did with that, right, that counting was just so that you knew where the beat was. But the song <clears throat> has a rhythm and the bass has a rhythm. I don't know if I can do both at the same time right now because I haven't practiced this one. But hmm, let me see. Let's slow it down. The reason for existence, not just to be alive, surely. What are we doing here? We did not ask to be. So what's the deal? Maybe we're just existing. Maybe we're all temporary. The wheel just keeps on turning. For an answer, we keep on yearning. <laughs> so my left hand and my right hand is just motoring along. That's just a riff. I got that. That means I can do anything with it now. Bass is happy. It's locked in. And now I can speak. I can sing. I'm not going to sing, like I said. But I can certainly speak rhythms over this bass line. And the first place I start is by counting. Just work out where the beat falls in relation to the plucked note and what rhythm you're saying and what word. So you start off with counting is good first. You don't even need to count. You can just make noises. Mm, 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 mm. If you don't want to have to think about what comes after one, because it's another distraction, you could just make noises. Mm, mm, mm. I think I find it easier to count. One, two, three, four. 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 One, two, three. So what have I done? I slowed it down and I found the space. I got it as slow as I need to get it so that eventually I can figure out, I'll give my brain time to go, oh yeah, two goes there. And then I've got my mental click for where the snare beat goes. One. So I'm hearing that I can't do that at the same time. I know people probably can. Someone's going to go beatbox, bass, slap craziness and do really well. Great, I'm not doing that. But I am hearing the pulse. I'm even hearing a drum groove a lot of the time when I'm playing bass. And I can lat latch on to that. But the initial thing is to just start feeling it. And what I'm going to do, because I'm doing another broadcast tomorrow, I'm going to do them at weekends, like I said, unless I'm touring or unless I'm gigging. I'm going to try and do it every week um, and I'm going to have guests like I said so it's not going to be me rambling on to tomorrow I may have a guest for tomorrow now that a couple of my friends have seen what I did today tomorrow I might not be alone I might not be Johnny no mates so that would be great if I've got somebody tomorrow you may meet one of my mates um, but if not what I'm going to be doing talking about groove so we're going to do a little bit of uh, exploring how to feel things and that's kind of Take a bit of investment. It takes a bit of investment of your body. You've got to lose your inhibitions to feel music. You have to lose those, do I look silly? Does anyone think I'm a, I look like a crazy person? Do I feel stupid? You've got to lose that. You've got to lose it. And you've just got to get into the music, shut the world out, focus in on the music and start to have, build this relationship of love and dance with the music. And by doing that, actually helps you to feel a particular style of playing whatever it is rock pop punk funk whatever it is and get into it and you can express it at that point authentically because 
You're not worrying about it. You're just in that moment concentrating on what's happening in the music. And so I use funk because it's my background, that and reggae. So Bob Marley and the Weathers and Stevie, you know, like classic. But, and Caribbean music, you know, Cal- Calypso. That music, when you watch people playing that music, um, and I mean live, and I don't mean the television shows where there's all this pressure. I just mean when in a bar, you're you're out in that environment where people play that music. Um, you see a different express, expression of that music. You see this commitment. It's like you see that in church as well, the musical commitment from the musicians. But um, sometimes we're in our heads a bit, us Westerners, thinking about session work. We're thinking about the red light problem. We're thinking about performances and being videoed and being analysed and taken down and fired. <laughs> Don't want to get fired. So that's a lot of pressure. But it means it takes you out of the music a bit, all of that stuff. So developing how to get into the music will help you feel. And then once that feel is embedded, then you can start worrying again because it's part of your body. <laughs> you don't want to worry. But you know what I'm saying? It's like you can then kind of like, you te- first of all, you teach yourself how to feel the music and then everything else happens. You can, as long as that pocket's been taken care of. So we're going to talk about what I do to get into a pocket. And that, that feeling... <laughs> holding on to each note I'm like ah, ah, that note and then I can leave this big space between each note and then just play the next one just with I hope this isn't actually too loud for you I just realised I'm slapping and I didn't check my slap sound if it's too hot let me know Still hearing the pulse. So anyway, I'm not going to go on about that too much. I'm going to do a whole episode about this. Um, It will involve shakers. There may be a drummer in the house. Other than that, um, I'm flitting about a bit because I've got so much to talk about, so much to share, so many things. I haven't even talked about session work. I haven't talked about the gigs I've done and the stages and the shows and the craziness. and the, hmm. So there's a lot to discuss and I want to share it all with you. Uh, I hope that you will come back and watch another stream. Uh, anybody enjoyed that, please tell your friends, come and hang out with us. Uh, I really appreciate your follow if you followed me and I appreciate your watch, which is great. I'm hoping to get to the right amount of um, followers and the watch hours and all of that minutes or whatever it is so that I can actually invite subscriptions in, which will help fund my band uh, and fund stuff I'm doing because obviously none of us are working. I've got a Patreon. Um, That's always appreciated. Uh, So, yeah, and, and other than that, what I do is available to all of you guys for free. So you can just watch, enjoy, take what you can from it. If anything's useful, use it. If what I'm doing inspires you to do something similar, the way you express who you are, do it. I don't see that as a problem at all. I hope I inspire you all to to join me, open up the doors to the inner sanctum of your musical soul and share with everybody, because that's what I'm going to do. And, you know, I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. And that's the end of my broadcast, my first one. Yeah. Take care. See you tomorrow, maybe, or maybe next week. Okay. Bye now.